Okay, welcome back. This is Chapter 5, Light, the Cosmic Messenger, out of the Essential Cosmic Perspective book. So we're going to start with light and matter, and our goals here is we're going to find out what light is and what matter is and how they interact with each other. What is light? We see the sunlight from the sun, we see light from the light bulb, but really, you take a flashlight, you can break up that light into its component colors. Uh, you've heard of Roy G. Biv in school from reds to the blues. So we take a prism or this uh, instrument here called diffraction grating and we can split that light up. And so all the energy in the universe is on the electromagnetic spectrum. And this goes from very high energy short waves, gamma rays, to x-rays, ultraviolet. The visible that we see is only a very small part. Infrared, the heat energy, and radio, which is very long wavelengths but very low energy. So, light is an electromagnetic wave. And we can talk about some of the properties of a wave here. Wavelength is a measurement from a peak of the wave down to another peak of another wave. If you shorten the wavelength, you increase the frequency. And so, particles of light are called photons. And each photon has, an energy, has a wavelength and a frequency to it. And the energy of the photon depends on that frequency and wavelength. So light and matter can interact either by emission, by absorption, transmission, or reflecting or scattering. So in reflecting and scattering, we have like a mirror that reflects light in a particular direction, or uh, like a movie screen that scatters the light in many directions. The interactions between light and matter determine the appearance of everything around us. So we learn light is a form of energy. It comes in many colors that we can put together in the electromagnetic spectrum. And ordinary matter is made of atoms. <coughs> matter, uh, matter can emit light, absorb light, transmit, or reflect, or scatter it. And these interactions tell us everything about us that we see. So now we'll go into uh, learning more about light. We're going to learn about the three types of spectra light can produce, uh, how light can tell us what the temperatures of planets and stars are, and even how light can tell us the speed of a distant object. So we have three types of spectra that we can look at. Uh, emission line spectrum, if we break up that light into its component colors, into the wavelengths of the colors, Sometimes they will emit certain colors at certain wavelengths, and that's an emission line. Uh, the whole spectrum of the whole object emits a continuous spectrum. And then uh, if there's a gas in that object that can absorb light, we see an absorption spectrum, and those are dark lines in that pattern. And I'll tell you that about 90% of everything we see in the universe has absorption lines, including most stars. So if you have a hot light source and you don't have any gas in between it, you break it up into its component colors, that's a continuous spectrum. If you have a cloud of gas emitting, it's going to emit an emission spectrum. And we see only certain lines show up in that color band. If you have a hot object, like a star, with a cloud of gas around it, which we usually see, then you can have an absorption line spectrum because that gas absorbs certain light out of that source depending on what it's made up of, what elements it has. And so here's a spectrum of the sun and we can see that the sun, I'll tell you, has mostly hydrogen and helium. So a lot of these lines are hydrogen and helium lines, but there's also things like neon uh, and that kind of thing in there. And so these are chemical fingerprints. And I won't get into the whole ionization part that's kind of like chemistry, but just understand that uh, in the atoms of the sun that make it up, there are uh, portions called electrons that orbit the atom. And those electrons have to stay within a certain shell around the atom. It's kind of like driving in the lanes of the highway. You have to be in certain lanes if you want to go to certain places. And so each of these uh, electrons have a certain place they belong. If they drop or go up a level, then we see a transition uh, unique to that element.
Okay. So, for instance, uh, some of the ones that are really neat are helium. Uh, they have a part in the sun. Sodium. These are called N and H K lines in sodium. And neon is really neat. It has a lot of bright red lines, of course. So we see that in neon light. So light can tell us about the temperatures of plant and stars too, depending on uh, the color of it. An object's thermal radiation spectrum depends on one property, and that's its temperature. And so we see here that hotter objects emit more light at all frequencies per unit area. And hotter objects will emit a higher average energy. And so if you have a star at 16,000 degrees here, Kelvin, it's going to emit more in the blue, whereas a cooler star, the kinds I researched as a grad student, are more red. They're a lesser temperature, 3,000 degrees. And so by carefully studying the spectrum, we can learn a great deal about that. And really, you know, we see a lot of pretty pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope and from ground-based telescopes. Those are really not all that we do. Most of what astronomy is is this boring spectrum stuff. Now, light can also tell us about the speed of a distant object, and this is through the Doppler effect. And we have things like red shifts and blue shifts that we look at. So, if we look at a laboratory spectrum, and we see these blue, green, and red lines that's stationary. If they shift towards the red side, it's moving away, and that is, that is called a red shift. If they move even farther to the red, it's moving away even faster. If they go towards the blue side, then it's moving towards us, and that's called a blue shift. And the more blue shift there is, the faster it's moving towards us. So we have learned that spectra is considered to be part of the continuous spectrum, emission line spectrum, and absorption line spectrum. And each atom has a unique, quote, fingerprint, or lane that it has to drive in. And we determine which atom something is made up of by looking at these fingerprints in the spectrum. Most large or dense objects emit a continuous spectrum, depends on temperature, and the spectrum of that thermal radiation tells us the object's temperature. And we learned about blue shift, which is moving towards us, red shift that is moving away from us. Now let's look at something more geared for us, collecting light with telescopes. We're going to learn about how telescopes help us learn about the universe and why we put some telescopes in space. So the most important thing about a telescope is its light gathering area, how big it is. The bigger it is, the more light it gathers. If you have an 8-inch telescope and a 16-inch telescope like they have at Missouri State University, the 16-inch will not gather twice as much light. It will actually gather four times as much light. We also want to have more detail in what we see, and so we call that angular resolution, being able to see fine details close up. So, you know, bigger is better. These are the twin Keck telescopes in Hawaii, you know, one of the largest ground-based telescopes there is. Now, today most telescopes are made with mirrors, but before they started making large mirrors, they used glass lenses. So here is the Yerkes 1 meter refractor that's about 40 inches, and this is in Chicago. Uh, of course, not a good place to look at the sky anymore, but this is the dimension of how you see this uh, portion down here, how big this telescope has to be, how long it has to be to support a 1 meter lens. And we now know that you can't build a refracting telescope that bends the light with a lens bigger than the 40 inches or a, or a meter because the weight of the lens would actually distort itself and we wouldn't get a good image. So we start building with bigger mirrors. And we used to cast one solid cell of a mirror, but now today what we normally do is we segment the mirrors. So here's a guy in the middle of this mirror for Keck. And you can see they're not all spherical. In fact, these are hexagon-shaped mirrors, and they're all about one meter apiece. And actually, the uh, mirrors sit on some actuators, like shock springs. And they adjust the, the mirrors 30 times in a second to counteract the atmosphere distorting that light. 
And so here's Mauna Kea in Hawaii, a very large observatory, about 16,000 feet up. But we can have different kind of telescopes. And so here is the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico. And it is the largest radio telescope in the world, built into a valley here. And they've been using this to look, uh, to listen for signs of intestinal, uh, in intellectual intelligence from space, and also looking at comets and asteroids. And if we need more than just this big, then we can go to something called interferometry. And this is a technique where we take large radio telescopes and we actually join them all together to make for a uh, single telescope. And these are actually riding on railroad tracks. And so they can move these to about uh, 40 miles across and co combine the total energy collected into uh, uh, an instrument that would be 40 miles across uh, electronically. And we can also do the same with x-rays. So we have an x-ray telescope called Chandra. And it's in space right now. Been up there for a long time, really. And uh, they have to focus a different way because of the way x-rays work. So let's say you want to buy your own telescope. I would say don't. Because really, you're going to throw your money away if you go to Walmart and buy a telescope. The ones that actually are worth the money, you have to order through a catalog or maybe a photo store or something like that. I would say get binoculars. And so binoculars are nice. You can get a nice, good uh close-up view of galaxies and star clusters from the moon and planets. Don't worry about magnification. That's just a sales pitch. It really is. Um, you want the bigger the better telescopes, the bigger mirror, and not get one with a lens. Uh, now, the eyepieces do have lenses in them. And so you can go to magazines like Astronomy, Sky and Telescope, Mercury Magazines, and Astronomy Clubs. There is an astronomy club in Springfield called the Springfield Astronomical Society, and they often have meetings and uh, uh, telescope viewings. I am a member of that. So we don't put telescopes like Hubble into space to get them closer to the stars. That's not true. We do that to get out of the atmosphere and the distortion that it makes. So we also have to deal with light pollution. That really hazes up our sky. And we also worry about the atmosphere. And so here we see a star from the ground and a star from Hubble uh, to get rid of that turbulence of the atmosphere called twinkling or scintillation. Sometimes the atmosphere absorbs certain wavelengths and that's true with ultraviolet x-rays so we have to put those kind of telescopes up in space and we have an infrared telescope called Spitzer. So telescopes in space solve these problems like a Chandra, a good friend of mine works on. And from Earth we can put on the adaptive optics here and that's what we looked at with Keck. And so here's a simulation of looking at Neptune without the adaptive optics and with a lot of difference. From the, from the ground, Jupiter looks like this, and with adaptive optics, much better.